Hey, this is Patrick Sullivan. Welcome to my shop. Recently, I made a decision to add some new or improved features to my bare bones economy priced drill press. You may have seen my earlier video on adding a digital depth gauge. It currently has a small auxiliary table that I built soon after buying the machine. I want to improve and enlarge that table to enable several new features, which I will get to in a future video. However, larger tables interfere with the operation of the rack and pinion mechanism for adjusting the height of the table. Even with this small auxiliary table I first built, I had to cut away quite a bit just to allow the crank handle to revolve. A new, bigger table would only worsen the problem. I wanted to find a way to operate the rack and pinion from below the table without having my hand scraping the underside. I also dislike fumbling around blindly to find the crank handle. Now, there's no practical way to change the location of the pinion gear relative to the table, so I thought I could replace the crank handle with a hand wheel. Now, there are hundreds of hand wheels on the market, but finding a wheel that was the right size, the right shaft diameter, and a reasonable cost turned out to be difficult. I probably spent a good 15 to 20 minutes browsing the internet, and then, in an impulsive move, I made a decision to design and build a hand wheel out of wood. I mean, how hard could this be? This sounded fun and seemed generally within my skill set. In practice, it took up enough time that I decided to focus this video exclusively on the building of the hand wheel. I'll show the rest of the drill press renovation in a second video. First, the design. I wanted the wheel to be about the same diameter as the circle of rotation of the crank handle. Sometimes the table has a heavy work piece clamped on it, and I wanted enough mechanical advantage to raise that weight easily. Second, I wanted the plane of the wheel located farther away from the central column than the pinion gear. This meant that the wheel had to be dished with angled spokes. This is where the complexity starts. I drew a design on my drafting program so I could print templates. I made the wheel itself as a hexagon formed with six segments of African mahogany. Six is a pretty forgiving number. If you make a ring out of, say, 20 segments, the chances that your ring will close tightly on the first try go way down. Even a tiny error in cutting is potentially multiplied by 40, which is the number of cuts you have to make. Wood turners who make large segmented ring bowls have developed a variety of tricks to get tight glue joints, despite lots of segments. I sort of took the easy way out. Less segments, but a little bit more wasted wood. You will notice that I glued the six segments together without any tenons, dowels, biscuits, or splines. If you were taught that ingrain joints like these are inherently weak, you need to watch my video on glue strength. I'll put the link in the description below. In fact, these joints are actually very strong. A bunch of rubber bands turn out to be adequate to clamp the assembly, providing the cut surfaces are smooth, flat, and actually 30 degrees. I printed a paper template of the wheel, showing the position of the spokes, and glued it to the hexagon. It's 7.5 inches, or 190 millimeters in diameter. I cut the wheel out of my scroll saw. I love this saw. Many people think scroll saws are only suitable for veneers and jigsaw puzzles, but mine had no trouble with the dense, tough African mahogany that I used. I, al I also use it to cut the hub, which was about 36 millimeters thick, or an inch and a half. Of course, it's slower than a bandsaw, but the cut surface is so good that it often requires no sanding at all. Moreover, the scroll saw really comes into its own with the more complicated inside shapes on this wheel. I was rather careless in cutting the outer perimeter, so I touched up the outer surface of the wheel on my disc sander, freehand. My goal here was just to take out ripples and depressions that would be easily visible. It took less than two minutes to smooth it out. Off camera, I cut a single long blank for the spokes and then rounded the edges on my router table. That seemed much easier to do while the stock was still long enough to control safely in the router. I cut the spokes to length on my miter gauge. The design requires that the ends be beveled to 45 degrees. The tenons also have to be angled to 45 degrees. I was not willing to handhold pieces this short, 
So I glued up the dedicated jig that you're seeing here using a couple of offcuts from the spoke blank. The jig needs to immobilize these small rounded pieces as it slides along the fence. This worked perfectly, except for the fact that each tenon face required two passes through the saw, forcing me to reset the fence position repeatedly. The result was that the six tenons were all straight and exactly the same length, but varied ever so slightly in width. I labeled each mortise in each tenon so that each pair could be individually fitted. The pointy end of each tenon has to be amputated. At the hub, those pointy ends will overlap with each other near the center. On the wheel, the pointy ends would extend all the way to the outer perimeter, where they would be visible and annoyingly palpable. The mortises for the tenons in both the wheel and the hub have to be very accurately aligned, so I printed an alignment template. I put the wheel back into the hexagon from which it had been cut to help paste the alignment guide on correctly. I printed a second copy for setting the alignment of the mortises in the hub. I traced the profile of each tenon on both the wheel and the hub. I then cut recesses the exact depth of the tenons using a trim router. The trick to freehand routing like this is to plunge down in the middle of the recess and enlarge that central hole by taking cautious amounts off the inside perimeter. When you get close to the lines, just shave off paper thin cuts. This keeps the bit under control. For the final straight lines, I used a sharp chisel paring off shavings. I cut the three mortises in the wheel using a rubber pad to immobilize the wood. When I got to the hub, I mounted it in a fairly heavy vise to keep it from moving. I actually do much of the fitting with a hand chisel, but I found it very helpful to use the router to create a flat base for the bottom of the mortise that is exactly the correct depth. Here the spokes are fitted in place without glue. I'll disassemble them to drill for the shaft and the locking set screw. The pinion gear has a short shaft that measures 9 16 of an inch in diameter or 14.3 millimeters, both uncommon sizes that made buying a ready-made hand wheel difficult. The shaft has a flat ground onto it, and the crank handle had a small set screw to hold it firmly onto the shaft. I used the same mechanism for the hub. I drilled a hole in the side of the hub, turned in a threaded insert, and off camera, put a headless set screw into the insert. Here you can see it installed. It feels solid. A round of her bit on a trim router gives about the right profile for a wheel that feels comfortable in my hand. I'm not trying to make it fully round. I cut the corners away in several shallow passes to reduce the risk of tear out. Normally, I would turn to PVA glues for wood joints, such as Tight Bond 3. However, I was worried that small errors in alignment might open the joints a little. In marked contrast to PVA glues, epoxy handles gaps beautifully, so I opted for epoxy. In retrospect, I think this was unnecessary. You have to glue up all six joints at the same time. So I used a medium setting epoxy with about 20 to 30 minutes of working time. I think quick set epoxy would be a disaster in this situation, at least for me. I glued all three spokes into the hub and then turned that assembly over and inserted all three spokes into the wheel. I was relieved to find that all the joints closed relatively easily on the first try. The shoulders of the tenons were visible on the sides where the spokes angled away from the mortises. I used a coarse file to taper the shoulders, blending them into the surrounding shapes. They're still visible, but much less noticeable. 
The file also cleaned up dabs of epoxy squeeze out and smears, which are kind of inevitable in this kind of glue up. I made a quick flap sander by stacking up about 10 to 12 strips of 220 grit sandpaper on a Dremel mandrel. This did a pretty good job of smoothing out the difficult areas close to the joints. I convinced myself that I did not need to do much hand sanding, although in retrospect, about 30 minutes of additional handwork would have helped the appearance considerably. What about some varnish? Well, this wheel will be handled almost every time the drill press is used. If I leave the wood bare, it'll eventually accumulate dirt and oil embedded in the surface. On the other hand, this is not a piece of fine furniture. It's a shop tool. So I just gave it two quick coats of spray lacquer and then a light sanding to knock off the surface irregularities, followed by one more coat of lacquer. I think that'll give it reasonable protection. This hand wheel's been a nice improvement. It is much easier to use and much more comfortable than the original crank. The force required to lift the table with a heavy workpiece is quite reasonable. There is some play in the original metal parts of the mechanism, but the new wheel is solidly joined to its shaft. I think it's attractive, and I'm pleased that it turned out this well. More importantly, this hand wheel now makes it possible for me to make a larger, much stronger auxiliary table, which will integrate a new dust collection system. I'll show the rest of the project in another video, which should be available soon. That's it for today. As always, thanks for watching.